Okay, so our, our next speaker um, is also uh, uh, not in the Department of Pediatrics, but also is doing some very interesting work with respect to uh, pediatric neurodegenerative diseases. Um, Dr. Um, Marius Wernig is an associate professor of pathology and by courtesy of chemical and systems biology and in the Institute of um, Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine, Stem Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine. He also is a Tasha and John Mortgage fam faculty scholar in pediatric translational medicine. Dr. Wernig's lab is interested in pluripotent stem cell biology and molecular determinants of neural fate decisions. His laboratory was the first to generate functional neuronal cells reprogrammed directly from skin fibroblasts. Today, he will speak with us on cellular reprogramming to model and treat pediatric myelin diseases. Marius. Thank you. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me here and this kind of introduction, which uh, means I can skip the first slides, actually. <laughs> That's exactly what I wanted to say. So I'm also very grateful for the support, um, uh, both financial, of course, uh, but also the um, wonderful environment that the uh, uh, CHRI is, is providing us here at Stanford, in particular the transla translational um, aspirations that, that we have here. So as was just mentioned, uh, my lab is uh, really interested in the um, molecular determinants that um, identify lineage identity. In particular, we're interested in uh, the formation of neuronal identity during, uh, during development. And the um, molecular substrate that ultimately dictates the trans transcriptional output of a cell and thus lineage identity is, of course, the combination of transcription factors that are being expressed in the cell, as well as the epigenetic, epigenetic makeup in the cell. And this slide just illustrates the, how important epigenetics are. So with the exact same genome, you can have a very different phenotype, depending on what epigenetic state you happen to find yourself in. So what is true for people is also true, of course, for cells. And uh, when you think about the, uh, um, the formation of neurons during development, there's really three main steps that self have, the cells have to take. First, you have to induce the neural lineage. Then um, so the cells typically mature. This point is very weak, but I've highlighted the uh, steps. And finally, once the cells are made, there must also be mechanisms in place that maintain the identity of these cells. So we set out to ask questions how the neuronal lineage and identity is induced to begin with. And um, following a very famous uh, dictum by Richard Feynman, what I cannot create, I do not understand. We set out to try to generate neurons from scratch. And what we did is we found three transcription factors called ac one BRAIN2, and mid one leg that were able to convert skin fibroblasts directly into neuronal cells. And importantly, these induced neural cells not only look like neurons, they also had the two main functional properties of neurons. Namely, they were able to fire action potentials, an intrinsic active property, as well as they were able to form synaptic contacts with themselves and with other neurons when we co-culture them. This was done in close collaboration with Tom Sudoslav, who helped us to characterize these cells functionally. So in addition to reprogramming that we're very excited about, which allows us to essentially move cell identities around the epigenetic landscape and um, not only convert into neurons, but specific other cell lineages, um, in combination with this reprogramming tools that we have now, there's of course uh, another world of, um, of biology, namely genetic engineering, that we think in combination will really make a huge impact on, on you know, future clinical um, care. So one of the grand ideas of the field is that we can combine, in particular, IPS programming with gene editing to provide new approaches for, for, for cell therapies, but also to understand diseases better. So the idea would be to take a skin a biopsy from a patient, reprogram them to um, the cells, to, to, to iPS as pluripotent cells, then either fix a disease-causing mutation or introduce another mutation that you think might be of disease relevance, then um, differentiate these cells into the cells of um, 
interest, either for, from a cell therapy point of view, a, a, a cell type that might ameliorate the, the symptoms, but or you could differentiate these cells into cell types that you think are important in pathogenesis. And in, for this project that was funded by CHRI, we wanted to, to use this system to understand a, a disease which is called Pelitzer's Merzberger disease. It's a very, luckily, very rare disease, but in this, the, the, the conatal form are really fa fatal. So the, um, it's an X-linked um, monogenetic disease caused by mutations in PLP1, which is a main myelin protein. And it's an X-linked disease, so it's affecting primarily boys, young boys. And um, um, the life expectancy is, is less than 10 years. What happens in these patients is that they are essentially devoid of myelin. So this here shows you a T2-weighted MRI a picture, and the clinicians among you will know that the signal in this T2-weighted MRI is uh, illustrating aqueous uh, solutions, essentially water molecules that you see. And on the right-hand side here, you see a normal brain, an age-matched um, MRI from a two-year-old normal boy, and you see, uh, sorry, just on the left, on the left side here, and you see that the uh, the central, the CSF, the liquid in the in the ventricles, are white, and there where the the white arrow is, um, you would expect the myelin. There is no signal. I mean, you compare this picture to the right side, which is a PMD uh, a boy, you see there is a lot of white signal in in the spaces where there should be myelin. And so it turns out that there is essentially no myelin formation in these, in these brains. So we got together with uh, David Roich, who at the time was um, at UCSF, who studied uh, this disease uh, in his clinical, in his cl clinical um, efforts. And we got a hold of um, skin of some of these patients and reprogrammed uh, skin fibroblasts into iPS cells, fixed the underlying PLP mutation in the cells by AAV targeting, and uh, then differentiated these cells into along the oligodendrocyte lineage. First, we uh, induced OPCs, which stands for oligodendrocyte precursor cells. And we adapted a protocol published by uh, Valentina, Valentina Fossati uh, a few years ago with a few minor tweaks. We could um, get this protocol to work pretty reliably. And uh, you generate these um, sort of sphere cultures that are enriched in these OPC-like cells. And once you plate them, down there on the right, you see that these cells can form these beautiful um, O4 positive um, oligodendrocyte cells. So uh, when we then differentiate both the mutant cells as well as the genetically corrected cells from the uh, Pilitzer's Merzberger disease patients, we noticed that while in both cases these precursor cells, these OPCs, would be formed at day 35, but over time they would disappear. And also, um, when you look at the morphology, we noticed that the cells really don't, didn't look that healthy. We quantified this, and indeed, when we trace the processes and quantify the complexity of the cells, there was a clear um, reduction of the complexity, suggesting that these cells failed to differentiate. So it looked like the cells were formed properly, but then couldn't be maintained and couldn't really differentiate properly along the mature oligodendrocyte lineage. So we wondered why do these cells disappear? Are they, are they somewhat stalled in their differentiation or are they actually dying from apoptosis? So we measured um, apoptosis rates with various methods, in, including this uh, caspase, this cleaved caspase 3 staining here. And indeed, this uh, apoptosis marker was enriched in the mutant population, suggesting that these cells are actually undergoing apoptosis as they try to differentiate. We then wondered why would that happen, right? So it's obviously a cell biological problem that these kids have. It's not what also could have been a possibility that this myelin protein is just screwing up the mature myelin. So it really looks like that there is a, a cell survival problem here. But what could be the reason? How is this, um, this mutation causing um, cell death? So um, we checked a few pathways uh, and mechanisms that people have proposed for other PLP mutations before. And the, and the main pathway that people think are, uh, is, is relevant is the unfolded protein response or an ER stress. So the idea is you have a misfolded protein due to, to, due to the mutation, which causes a sort of an overload of proteins in the, 
in the ER, which then uh, causes this ER stress and eventually leads to apoptosis. So we noticed that the mutant PLP protein, shown here in green, is actually quite nicely distributed throughout the cell but, and also found on the, on the membrane, not so much stuck in the ER. And accordingly, we didn't really see the activation of any of these ER stress markers. So we, we explored other possibilities and we, we, we noticed there's oxidative stress also going on. But one key insight was when Hiroko Nobuto, the, uh, Nobuto, the postdoc in the lab, who, who, uh, who um, undertook this project, um, looked at iron metabolism in the cells. And she did it because it's a long st standing observation, but not really well understood, that there is something unique going on with iron metabolism and oligodendrocytes in the brain. So when I studied medicine many, many decades again, I guess I can say ago, <laughs> I learned that apotransferrin, which is the main iron carrier in the, in the blood, is produced by the liver. And that's it. Turns out in the brain, it's mature oligodendrocytes that produce enormous amounts of apotransferrin as well. So it's bizarre, why would oligodendrocytes really do that? So that was really the main driver why Hiroko looked at this and she, she compared again the expression of some iron regulatory uh, genes, including apotransferrin, um, and compared the mutant and, and wild type oligodendrocytes. And she noticed, indeed, there's a deregulation of some of these uh, proteins, including uh, transferrin, sorry, the pointer is so weak, uh, which, which you see on, on, uh, on the lowest level here, labeled TF, which is apotransferrin, is severely downregulated in the, in the mutant cells. So since apotransferrin can be purchased, and it's actually a, a normal already uh, component of, of our media, why, we thought, why don't we just try to add more apotransferrin to these cells? Perhaps that is a simple rescue of, of the phenotype. And indeed, that's exactly what happened. When, uh, as a, comp a control, um, Hiroko adds holotransferrin, which is iron-bound transferrin, and then uh, compared it to apotransferrin, which is the iron-free version of, of uh, transferrin. And she treats the corrected cells, really not much happens. In both cases, you know, the cells are happy and, and survive. But you see the effect down there um, on the mutant, in a mutant situation, where we get essentially a complete rescue of this differentiation phenotype. And now we have these beautiful, mature oligodendrocytes developing in this mutant back background. And the effect seems to be as potent as repairing the disease-causing mutation itself. So then you got really excited about this, because there is already FDA-approved iron chelators out there, small molecules, that you think do the same thing, complexing iron, chelating iron in the, in the media. So and one of these drugs is called deferoxamine, and so when she adds a deferoxamine to the exact same setup, we see, we see a very, very similar uh, rescue of, of the phenotype. When she adds back iron, um, we see again uh, a toxic effect, so it seems to be specific to iron um, molecules and not other, not other ions. And uh, on the right, you just see here the quantification, and you see how impressive the rescue actually is from this very simple, you know, small molecule treatment of these cells. So the big question is now, this is all in vitro, does this also work in vivo? And uh, we did various approaches, and one of the um, um, experiments that um, addressing this, this question is by transplanting these human oligodendrocytes into a, a mouse brain. We used the Shivera brain, which is not the PLP mutant brain, but an, an, a, a brain that is de devoid of a different um, myelin protein, the MBP uh, gene. So, so they also have a myelin dysfunction, but it's not the same gene affected. And it's the standard model in the field to assess, essentially, oligodendrocyte survival after transplantation. And um, so what Hiroko did, she treated these cells for just two weeks um, before the transplantation period. So it's only a, a pre-treatment, and of course, after transplantation, there's, there's no, um, no iron chelation going on anymore. You should either diferoxamine or apotransferrin, and this is the remarkable result. The corrected cells that you see up there, as expected, they form these beautiful oligodendrocytes that are they're forming these, these myelin sheets at the neighboring axon segments, and, and you know, have this, this multi-layer um, um, uh, membrane uh, um, sheets around the axons. And untreated PLP mutant cells hardly survive. It's very difficult to find any of these transplanted cells. But if you do, they, they, they are really poor in morphology. And in the 
top, uh, sorry, bottom right corner here, you see the situation where the cells were pre-treated for, um, for a short period of time before transmutation, and again, these cells seem to be rescued, suggesting that perhaps we are lucky, and we only need to um, bring these mutant cells over a, a, a critical period during their differentiation from a precursor cell to a mature cell, and once they are over this hump, potentially, the cells are more um, resistant to, to the mutation and can survive better. So hopefully we, we would only need to cover this, this critical period in their, in their life of, of a differentiating cell. So of course this is, um, um, oh yeah, so we also looked at uh, ultrastructural evidence for myelin formation and really excitingly we see beautiful myelin formation at the sites of transmutation. So that is of course really exciting and brings me to my last slide. Could that perhaps be translated faster than we had ever hoped or, or envisioned because um, deferoxamine is an FDA approved drug and it turns out there's um, an analog is called deferoprone which is actually going uh, into the brain, it's going through the blood brain barrier and in principle any physician at this point in time could already prescribe this drug to, to these PMT patients. So of course we would like to collect data want, if people start doing this, so, so together with David Rovich we are trying to plan a small clinical trial to see whether that might actually have an effect in people. This is the lab, as you can see we are a fun group of, of people, it's a great joy to, uh, to walk into my lab every day and uh, the essential um, carrier of this whole project was Hiroko Nobuta who was a shared poster between my lab and um, David Rogers' lab. Thank you very much for your attention. That's fascinating work. Questions for Marius? So I have a question that relates to why do these cells die in the presence of excess iron? Is it free radical damage? Is yes, yes, very good question. So um, we looked quite um, uh, uh, intensively in, in, into this. And it's, it's not intuitive why you know, a membrane-bound um, protein that is muted should, should cause some, you know, something like that and should be more sensitive to extracellular iron. That's what it looks like. So it's really extracellular. So it's intriguing that's a membrane a protein. What we found is that there is oxidative stress also induced in these cells. And we, we mapped it that is being downstream of uh, the iron metabolism. So when you rescue the, um, the cells with um, deferoxamine, for example, the oxidative stress levels go down. We can also rescue the phenotype with antioxidants. Mm -hmm. And there are two classes of antioxidants. There's uh, some that are um, hyperhydrophobic and non-hydrophobic. And only the ones that are hydrophobic rescue the, uh, the phenotype. So it looks like there is lipid peroxidation yeah. particular going on. And there's a, been a pathway described called ferroptosis. It's an iron-mediated lipid peroxidation associated cell death. So a different way of, I guess it's distinct from apoptosis, uh, what people say. So we checked this pathway very carefully and not all criteria, not all parameters are really fulfilled in, in our cells, but many of them are. So it's a ferroptosis-like mechanism that these cells seem to die from. Well, I'm particularly interested in it, so I'll ask one more question, and that is um, iron-associated lipid-free radical oxidation often results in mitochondrial damage and mitochondrial death. And if the mm -hmm. mitochondria die, then the cell's going to die. And I wondered whether, right. is this what you see? That's a good point. We actually haven't looked at mitochondria yet. Okay. Yep. Oh, that's great. I'm going to fa speed date with him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Marius. All right.